So welcome back to another episode of the Wild Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Alyssa Finnig. I'm so excited to have my guest today, Angelique, because if you know me and you're around Indianapolis, you know that Angelique is one of my best friends. <laughs> and uh, we actually met through Thai massage training yep. a few years ago. So we have so much in common. We co-teach our teacher training at Embark, my studio together. We do so many things. Uh, we host... Uh, solstice events yep. and uh, other gatherings and uh, we're just become great friends a true testament to how when you get into the things that you really love and adore yeah how you can also bring the people who are the right fit for you into your space and into your community yep. so thank you angelique for being here today thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure. I'm excited. And because we're at the Village Recording Studio in Broad Ripple, I get to hang out and see everyone and chill on a couch and, and just have a conversation. And yeah. I love that. And of course, we do, you know, we do interviews with people all over the world, but it's really fun when we can just hang out. Sit and, be and chat and relax. So I always like to start out with, you know, what led you into becoming a yoga teacher, finding yoga, sure. um, holistic practices, wherever you want to start and share with our audience. Okay. Well, back in the beginning of my tender youth, um, when I had my kids, actually, this is how the whole thing started. So I had a rupture in some lumbar discs when I was pregnant with my son, and my daughter was only nine months old or so. So um, for that pregnancy was sort of difficult just because I was trying to heal through that. Um, and I got through that and it was a couple of years later and I had a huge episode and I have trouble walking and I was still trying to chase around two babies for all intents and purposes. Um, ended up at a chiropractor. I didn't like the chiropractor, but he gave me some quote unquote physical therapy exercises that were yoga. I recognized them from watching Lilius on PBS before Mr. Rogers started. And I loved her. And I always, I had a girl crush on her before I even knew what girl crushes were <laughs> because she had this really pretty long braid and she was just very soothing and nurturing. And I did the yoga then when I was a kid and I didn't even know what I was doing. Did I tell you I met her at Kripalu? No. <laughs> <gasps> And I just touched your hand and you met Lilius. I'm yes. so excited. So okay. vicariously, I just yes. sent her energy This is why we're friends, Of course. Girl. <laughs> so I had that huge episode and I, I got these exercises from the chiropractor. And I was like, dude, this is yoga. I can, I can do yoga at home. So I invested in some DVDs, which happened to be... Um, Rodney Yee and some of the other Gaim teachers, um, BKS Iyengar style, which was unbeknownst to me, probably the perfect thing at the time because they were teaching me how to modify my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I start from there and I had a home practice by myself with dogs and kids running around for about 15 years mm -hmm. um, and figuring it out on my own and, and how to make my practice work for how my back was working any particular day. Um, and then fast forward, um, my, a friend of mine dared me to start running, which was probably the worst thing in my mind that I could do for myself at the time just because... I don't run unless tigers are chasing me. <laughs> so he dared me to run and called me a sissy for not wanting to. And that at that, that point, it's a matter of pride. So I meet the divorced runners group and they find out that I do the yoga. And so they wanted me to teach them how to stretch to help with their recovery times, because these are people who I didn't know it at the time are like serious about their PRs and their performance. And so my friend gets this little group of people together on Sundays and I lead them through a practice and it's that goes on for a year and I am, you know, Captain Oblivious. And so I don't know that these people are iron men and professional athletes and bodybuilders and they they really are looking to me to better their performance. I don't know. I think we're just eating pancakes after yoga. So I started to really 
have to consider what I was teaching. And I'm realizing in com complete humility that I, I don't know and I don't want to hurt them. So that was my first um, spark that I need to I need to figure this out. And so I investigated some teacher trainings in the area and I ended up doing my 200 hour studies at Peace Through Yoga mm -hmm. um, here in Indianapolis. Um, continued to uh, teach the Divorce Runners Club. And then at this point, we're up to two yoga classes per week because I was doing a beginner's class and an intermediate class. Mm -hmm. um, and then they very sweetly gave me an appreciation gift after our very last class together. Um, and it was a gift certificate to a local yoga studio here. Um, and that was the very first time that I had ever taken studio classes mm -hmm. in the 16 years at that point that I had been practicing. That was the first time I had walked into a yoga studio. And having someone teach me and put their hands on me and adjust me opened up my practice in a huge, huge way. So that goes on. I continue my um, teacher training with uh, 500 hour instruction, wonderful senior teacher here in Indianapolis, again, through um, Peace Through Yoga, um, got my 500 hour certification. I started teaching um, what I had come to know as a restorative style. Um, by that time, um, with all of the running and the, the races that I had done, my body was taking it hard and it was really showing up in my back and my hips. Um, and so I started slowing down my personal practice and propping up my body, depending on how my joints were performing that day. Um, and then, you know, again, Captain Oblivious, so that's a restorative practice. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I can teach that for sure. That would be amazing because my body has benefited so much from it. Um, and then in that 500 hour training, uh, one of my friends was doing a congruent Thai massage training and needed practice bodies. And so I signed up for that because for one thing, I had never done it before. And for another thing, yes, please massage me. Um, and so I got that and realized, oh my gosh, we can do restorative yoga and the kind of manipulations that's going to open up those po Yes, please open that even more. And so that completely blossomed what I'm what I'm teaching now. And then through that, you and I got connected. Mm -hmm. um, uh, having that when you brought the the time massage training from Still Light Center and um, and meeting Albert Lee and and him becoming a really great teacher for me um, and mentor. And here we are. Now I'm at Embark and I have that uh, Wednesday morning class and we're combining restorative yoga with Thai massage and people are leaving there sighing heavily with, I'm assuming, bliss and joy and relaxation and mm -hmm. and they keep coming back. So yeah, I, I feel like I'm on the right path. <laughs> you are. I see quite a few people pre-registered for the today's class after we've recorded oh, this great. podcast too. So I don't maybe know. I can't to... check that. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will uh, be the technology there, person. Yes, for please. You. Thanks. <laughs> um, so let, you know, let's talk about before we get into restorative yoga and Thai massage, um, because you know that's a love for both of us. Yes. And I love how you share and explain that. Uh, one thing that stood out was when you transferred from practicing at home, which I think is great for everyone. Yes. It's accessible. Um, it's affordable. You know, uh, I, I practice at home still mm -hmm. sometimes in, in addition to the studio. But the difference it made going into a studio and, and not just, you know, any studio, but studios in general, I guess. Um, and then having teachers, because you've probably been with lots of teachers and they, there's... Mm -hmm differences in every teacher. Yes. Um, but having teachers teach alignment, hands-on, so help with body awareness. Yes. Um, you know, getting fuller into a pose or adapting yes. for your body mm -hmm. and, you know, your the injury you had had or the things that you can t deal with con chronically. Mm -hmm. Ex you know, talk more about that and share with our audience why that is so significant and important. I think because we all 
we're in our bodies every day. We don't see those little changes. Um, just as an offhand example, um, you know, if, if I hadn't seen you in six or eight weeks and you see me for the first time, oh my gosh, your hair is so much longer. And I'm mm-hmm. like, really? Is it? I don't know. My hair is my hair. It's on my head every day. Mm-hmm. All I have to do is brush it. Mm-hmm. But you see something that I don't catch because you have fresh eyes. Mm-hmm. So when a teacher in a studio comes across a student who may or may not have been practicing for as long as I was practicing. Mm -hmm. They could be brand new. They could be a longtime practitioner. But that particular teacher sees something new that day, and that understanding can be brought to that student who can always learn something different from a new perspective. Mm -hmm. And so that teacher can help them to adjust their footing so that the foundation of their pose is stable. They can help them move or rotate their arm in such a way that their ribs open up maybe differently in a pose. Mm -hmm. And those tiny little things, those tiny little tweaks or adjustments can make a huge difference in a person's practice immediately and in the long term because your body changes ever so slightly, ever so subtly, every time you practice. If it's a five-minute breath practice or if it's in a 75-minute vinyasa class, your body changes every time you practice. And so having someone from the outside evaluate and adjust, your body picks up all of those benefits and it filters through them. And the next time you come to your mat, it's a completely different experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, Completely agree. Um, my first teacher, Cindy Lee, always talked about yoga as creating a relationship with yourself. So Absolutely. I always say that. Um, and that's where that objectiveness of a well-trained teacher can mm-hmm. help you learn about your body. And therefore, yeah. you start to create a relationship with, your, with yourself with that body awareness and learning the different ways to open your body or move or yes. adapt. And then, of course, you can go even deeper and then create even more of a relationship mm-hmm. with yourself, with the practices. Um, and I think that's an important with, you know, the, the use of props. Absolutely. And uh, we, we both use those so heavily, and mm-hmm. not just in restorative, but even when we teach active classes. Um, the use of props are helpful because not everyone can reach the floor or right. um, their pelvis is you know, tight and they need a little attention height when they sit down and I I, you you want to talk anything about the use of props or Um, even restorative that could be a good segue into our talk of absolutely when I was doing my 500 hour training Mm -hmm. I thought it was a detriment that my body could not perform the way that it once had Mm -hmm. um pretty much through that whole training time for me, I was in a huge flare up with my back and I usually couldn't practice with my fellow teacher trainers. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge downer in my head. I was, it was getting in my head. It was maybe I shouldn't be teaching yoga. And at one point, my teacher said to me that this struggle was going to be the thing that made me a good teacher Mm -hmm. because I was going to have to figure out how to adapt my practice, and it would make me um, empathetic for people that didn't know how to adapt, didn't have an awareness of their body, didn't know or have the confidence to even begin to take yoga classes. Um, And so having to use the props and having to make adjustments so that I could continue to practice at all really does make a difference in how I teach. Mm -hmm. So I have this, even though I teach a restorative class and we don't, we don't get off of the floor very often. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I always say that I teach a guided nap, Mm -hmm. but if I see someone that can't open up their knees fully to a cobbler's pose, I am on that like a duck on a June bug, and I've got bolsters and blankets to make sure that their knees are as supported and as held as they can be. 
-hmm. because that takes the stress out of the pelvis. It takes the stress out of the groins. It takes the stress out of the low belly and the low back. And then that person can start to breathe because they're not, A, worried that they're going to hurt themselves. They're not in as much or any pain as they were two or three seconds ago. Mm -hmm. And they can start to breathe into that pose. And in breathing into that pose, that breath goes to all of those places that are a little bit tight. And again, they will be different the next time that person practices. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've had many people say to me, oh, I had a shoulder injury and they could have done it in yoga. Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. Uh, I have a shoulder injury. I can never do yoga again because mm -hmm. they think they can't do a downward jog and that's all that and yoga is. And that's all is. that yoga is, right. Yeah. And yoga is more than that. You know, that's why I created Embark mm -hmm. because I wanted to raise awareness of therapeutic yoga, but also the different styles. And I'm, I'm proud that we have so many different styles like Yengar, Vinny Yoga, Restorative, Vinyasa. Yep. But there's, you don't have to do a downward dog. Like, nope. there are adaptations if you've hurt your shoulder, whether in yoga or if you've had um, shoulder injury, frozen shoulder, whatever, yep. and other things too, back issues. Um, and But uh, so many people quit their yoga practice mm -hmm. because they think, well, I can't do sun salutations anymore, or I can't do downward dog because right. they think that's what yoga is. Yeah. And um, it's so much more than that. And, the, you, know, the, you know, that's why I've started the podcast. Yes. I just want to share so much of that with everyone. Well, one of the reasons, um, and I spoke a little bit about when I f was first injured and uh -huh. I had to go to the first chiropractor um, and he was telling me, well, you probably shouldn't do this or this. You probably can't do this or this anymore. And I'm in my head, I'm thinking, but it, but why? I, my body is still my body. Mm -hmm. I, yes, it's been injured. Yeah, it hurts a lot, but I know that I don't feel as good if I don't move. Mm -hmm. If I stop moving, I can't imagine how bad I will feel if that just perpetuates itself. So whoever's out there listening, please don't stop moving. Please don't stop moving. Do something every day. Move somehow every day because you will feel better. Mm -hmm. You will feel better. I promise you. Mm -hmm. Don't ever stop moving. And don't ever think that you are completely cut off from a practice because of a temporary injury. There are so many ways to adapt and so many ways to heal the body. It's not ever cut and dry. Mm -hmm. It's not ever cut and dry. Yeah. I had a thought, but I'm going to let it go okay. because it's probably distasteful. <laughs> we'll keep the distance. We try to keep this. <laughs> I'll try to PG, keep it um... PG, you guys. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it's true. You know, I have, um, I, I think of, we have an eight-year-old man. He just celebrated his 80th birthday at our studio. Yay. But he can't do headstand. But he comes with his I daughter. I can't do a headstand so on we, some days. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't really practice that many yeah. inversions except for legs up the wall and mm -hmm. shoulder stand. Um, <laughs> uh, but but he does. He know he can do it now on the rope wall by himself. Woohoo! And I'm just like, and we we're having a conversation about because my grandmother is 82 and he's he just turned 80, and he he was like, you know. It's, it, I can't remember how he brought it up, but somehow, like, you know, is this normal? <laughs> like that, I, but it's because he's remained active his entire yes. life. And his wife comes to the studio. She doesn't do that same style because she's had back surgery. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want to do all that stuff. So she does the gentle, more Vinny yoga style. Good on and, her. But it was my grandma, she's falling apart because she doesn't move and she mm -hmm. doesn't eat right. Mm -hmm. And it's so important just yep. to move, whether you're doing you know, yoga, is, you know, we have big proponents, of course. Yep. Um, but just walking, anything. Anything, anything. Mm -hmm. And my mom today, mark the day, today is the day that my mom starts to try chair yoga with me. So oh, after I teach it in Bark, uh -huh. I'm going over to mom and dad's house oh, good. and she's going to have her first chair yoga session oh, with me wonderful. in the privacy and comfort of her own home. Yeah. But yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. I think and it's great. When she's, we can share with she's willing. She's willing, willing now. <laughs> it took some convincing, you know, and I always offer that it's never an obligation. You don't have to do yoga with me, mom, just because I'm a teacher and <laughs> learn stuff, whatever. <laughs> 
<laughs> but now she wants to. It takes them a while. Yeah. Well, you know, in the last episode, Shai Plonsky and I were talking about uh, me giving my dad time massage. And oh, yeah. now he's like, I feel 10 years younger. Yeah. But of course, he won't come to the studio because nope. that's an inconvenience. Right. But I have to come to his house. But because that's totally convenient for you. <laughs> I know. We right? love you, Dad. <laughs> we do love you, Dad. <laughs> um, but it is, uh, you know, one thing Shy and I talked about was the gift of, you know, whether you're a yoga teacher or eye massage or do both, that you mm-hmm. can give to your family and yes. loved ones when they're willing. When they're willing. Because, you know, you can't force it on them. Well, and that's when mm-hmm. it's going to do them the most good. Exactly. Because especially with. Putting your hands on someone's body Mm -hmm. and with the intention of facilitating their healing, Mm -hmm. that energy doesn't flow unless it's going both ways. Mm -hmm. That person has to be receptive. Exactly. You have to give. That person has to be receptive. And that's when things really start to charge up. Mm-hmm. That's when it makes a difference. Totally. Completely agree. And that's true with any relationship. Yeah, that, exactly. Well, let's talk about restorative yoga. I know that what you love. Mm-hmm. You know, I love it too. Your guided naps are awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and so share with the audience what that is. So, so this morning I did yoga nidra practice. Oh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't restorative, but it made me think preparing for the podcast today yeah. of the restoration that your body needs on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Right. And um, I was just like, I did a 35 minute practice and was like, I need this probably every day right now, uh, especially through the holidays. Yeah. So um, share with the audience what is restorative yoga, the benefits, why you love it so much. Well, for me um, and in my experience, and that's really the only perspective that I can give you because that's all I got. Um <laughs> For me, restorative yoga is the essence of giving yourself permission to slow down and to breathe. Mm -hmm. That's 95% of what I want my students to get out of every single practice. Give yourself permission to slow down and breathe. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference what poses we're doing. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't. If it did it might be important to get off of the floor, (laughs) but it's not. It's true. So taking the time to take a breath and let it fill up your whole body. That's it. The end. We're done with Mm -hmm. the podcast. That's the most (laughs) important thing. It is. The breath is huge. Yeah. We have experiences every day every day we experience this life it's good it's bad we attach all of these judgments and names to it our brain has that emotional thought Mm -hmm. i feel happy i feel sad this made me angry this makes me whatever it is your experience is going to trigger some sort of emotion in your brain your body has a physiological response to that. If you're happy, you get this tingly sensation like butterflies in your belly. And if you're nervous, maybe it's a little higher up and it feels like mosquitoes instead of butterflies. It's not as pleasant, Mm -hmm. but it's still that weird sensation in the abdomen, that gut brain. Um, You know, if you're afraid, your heart starts to pound and you feel that weirdness in your chest. Those are physiological sensations that accompany the emotion that's happening in the brain. And so when those two things are combined, we have this feeling of that total experience. And it's the physiological response that gets stuck sometimes Mm -hmm. because when we are, even if it's happy or, or panic, we get this elevation in our breathing and we're breathing in the top of our chest and our body is responding to what needs to happen right now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times in this particular culture, we don't ever come out of that. We go from getting yelled at by somebody at work to having this wonderful moment with our child and it's all up here in our chest. Our heart heart is racing because we can't really tell off that person at work. And then our heart is racing because our beautiful child comes up and hugs us because they've missed us all day. But the body thinks, my heart is racing. Mm -hmm. And unless you take a second 
to slow down and really look that beautiful child in their face and inhale and exhale and let all the rest of the stuff go, your body won't be able to determine the difference between those two things. Mm -hmm. It thinks it's all the same. Mm -hmm. So slowing down, getting still, having a moment for crying out loud and just breathe. Mm -hmm. And the slower your body is, the slower your breath will be. And in those very slow, deep breaths, our parasympathetic nervous system says, oh, that work person is not here. Mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about that right now. I can enjoy this moment with my beautiful, wonderful child who loves me. And all of that releases through the body. Little knots start to untie themselves. We don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do anything. That's one of our wonderful design capabilities in our human body is mm -hmm. that we are fully capable of handling a stressful situation, letting it go, and enjoying a moment of peace and allowing that moment of peace to work through whatever it is in our body that needs attention and needs love and fix it. Mm -hmm. Our bodies can fix themselves if we give them the time and the breath to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the beauty about taking time for a restorative yoga practice, for yoga nidra, um, for any of these any that of just rejuvenate the body. Mm -hmm. It's so needed. Um, you know, and a lot of times what I share with people, because because they are just programmed. I mean, you get mm -hmm. conditioned to be in, and I know I've been there, uh, and I get there still some days. That's why I do <laughs> yoga nidra and restorative practices, especially in the holidays. It's great. Oh, yeah. But um, so what happens is we're always in this mode, this running, 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 you know, running from the bear, you mm -hmm. know, heart racing, some those kind of things. And it's oftentimes we can't go straight to a restorative class or yoga nidra right. because we don't know how to settle down. And that's where the more active classes are helpful. Yes. Uh, in, and especially I really love when there's like half active, half restorative. Yes. In a well-designed, well-sequenced class, so if it, you know, active or even restorative, mm -hmm. uh, but especially the active ones like a vinyasa or a yingar or ashtanga will warm you up get you to that peak where you've really worked off that anxiety yes. and that all that yeah. heat builds mm -hmm. up and your body says yes i got this i yep. can do anything and then brings you down to chill and reset your body and, the, mm -hmm. and then the difference with yoga versus other exercises is that you do have that shavasana at the yes. end that guided relaxation so you you know if you're out there and you're like I would love to do that. That sounds so great. How would I get there? How do I there do this? There is an entryway yes. through a more active yoga practice. Um, but making sure, and I tell my yin yoga students mm -hmm. all the time, don't just do yin yoga. You also need to do strengthening. Right. <laughs> you know, so we all need that balance. But for those who are really running on anxiety, heart racing all the time, oh, yeah. Just get into the yoga movements, whether it's a gentle practice, whether you, you're an adrenaline junkie mm -hmm. and you need to meet yourself there. Yep. And then that helps guide you into a slower practice. Yep. That is, um, you know, this kind of came up in the last episode of Shy too, because he talks about how slow can you go when it comes to giving a time massage. Oh, yeah. And uh, in just in general in our society, mm -hmm how we need to slow down slow down it doesn't mean sit on the couch eat potato chips slow down no that's still that's <laughs> stagnant yes that's that different the than other slow. extreme yeah it is the we need the balance mm -hmm. i know when i have the balance of days off during the week yes. of um i'm not working and i'm going outside hiking or i'm doing something with a loved one you know mm -hmm. something else that I am a much better teacher, mm -hmm. a much better business owner, mm -hmm. a much better um, practitioner when I'm working with Thai Massage yes. and my clients. And they can feel it and they give me feedback. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's so important for people to grasp this concept. Yes. And I know, you know, I've been told before, like people love that there's more restorative um, at our studio and there's other studios who mm -hmm. have that too, but there's those slowing down options because yes. 
that's missing from our society. Well, even in the mm -hmm. Iyengar classes, mm -hmm. our teachers modify, mm -hmm. which is everything. It's everything. I feel like if anybody off the street came into Embark mm -hmm. and said, I've never done this before. Yes, we definitely have classes where a beginner would feel completely comfortable, mm -hmm. but any of those mm -hmm. classes they could step into and let the instructor know and they would they would feel right at home. Yep. Well, that you know that's my intention mm -hmm. for people to feel at home. But even in a yengar, like it's a very active practice and it can be mm -hmm. a vigorous practice. But every four weeks it's a restorative from pranayama. Uh. So there is that still rotation Cyclical. built in mm -hmm. that we need to rest and restore the body yeah. in addition to the advanced inversions, the standing, you know, back bends and right. all of these very, um, and even for going into forward folds, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, that internalness yes. of the forward folds. But there, even within the vigorous practice, there is the, the balance and that's, you know, I love Iyengar Absolutely. yoga. Um, and so I think it's very important. So, you know, restorative yoga, just for someone who hasn't done that, and yes, time to relax, time to breathe. Mm -hmm. But Angelique mentioned before that if you're lying down in a cobbler's pose, so your feet are together, knees apart, you're going to be supported so that you're not gripping within the legs right um, so all of these poses your 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 body's draped over bolsters yes. you want to kind of share more uh yeah mm -hmm. you're exactly right mm -hmm. um we use bolsters blankets blocks straps um sometimes we'll use chairs or the wall mm -hmm. um the floor predominantly is the prop mm -hmm. of yeah. my choice <laughs> um but it's all about making sure that the body doesn't have to create tension in one area in order to relax another area. Mm -hmm. So as I'm going through and I'm guiding my students and um, I like to prop ferry them. So mm -hmm. while they're in one pose, I'm getting everything ready so mm -hmm. that they don't have to really come out of their mental mm -hmm. um, place to get everything ready for the next pose. But in child's pose or in a uh, cobbler's pose, getting them to be able to support their belly, their knees, their uh, the bend in their back, their forehead. So we bring whatever part of the floor their body is having trouble accessing, we bring that up to them. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have to force, they don't have to tighten, they don't have to effort mm -hmm. other than keeping track of their breath mm -hmm. and so their body gets to relax covered up and warm and cozy and safe and grounded and peaceful mm -hmm. and then they breathe mm -hmm. it always comes back to the breath i completely agree with that um Take a moment uh, to explain the difference for our audience between restorative yoga and yin yoga. Because my niece, you know, I've taught her since she was three. Yes. She's the whole reason why I became a yoga teacher. She's 14 now. But she's taken both and she's sort of like, they're the same. And, and, <laughs> and, and you know, they, they can be very similar, very especially similar. if you don't have enough props in a studio yeah. or wherever you're yeah. hosting a restorative class, you can do more prop lists, which seems even more similar to yin. So I, I think you have a good well, I think that's the main difference. Mm -hmm. In a yin class, where you're holding the poses in order to get into smooth muscle and fascia changes, um, you are still supporting your own body weight. Mm -hmm. You still have to have the strength in order to hold yourself up off of the floor or in a stretch to get the, the full benefit of those poses. Which is great because we don't have to. It's time for me to go to yoga. Okay. <laughs> um, we don't have to take the time to get all those props ready. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, uh, for whatever ego reason, d feel like props are a weakness. Mm -hmm. So a yin class sometimes is a nice gateway mm -hmm. for them to get into a restorative class where yeah. they trust their body to be able to slow down. Mm -hmm. Um, yin is a slightly more 
active mm -hmm. because you are holding up your own body weight. Um, but in restorative, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. the, the props ground you. The yeah. props hold you. And then in, in my particular class, I will come around with the hands-on adjustments that are Thai massage inspired for sure, or even actually mm -hmm. some Thai massage while they're in the poses so that those muscles get a little bit of extra stimulation and, and energy work. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. and I know, you know that students love and come back to classes when we have hands-on stuff. I mean, I get told that all the time. I know you do. Well, one of the mm -hmm. huge things about it is that no one touches anyone anymore. Uh -huh. We yeah. can't even hug our friends without doing that weird, awkward little pat thing on the back. But our hearts don't connect mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't want to touch cheek to cheek anymore because that's very intimate. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that that was OK. Mm -hmm. And now for whatever reason, either because we're not interacting with people face to face mm -hmm. or um, or touch to touch, we don't touch enough. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this was just a meme or a genuine study, but the human body needs six hugs a day to survive, mm -hmm. not to thrive. Mm -hmm. So if you go through your whole day and you don't touch anybody, your body knows that. Mm -hmm. Your body knows that. And it knows as soon as someone touches you. Mm -hmm. We'll be sure to hug. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going right to hug afterwards. you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, you guys can't see that. But, um, <laughs> do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's so you. I had a lot of thoughts. <laughs> well, but I think I got them all out. Oh, I think it was great. I think I'm good. Thanks. Yeah, I thought this was I conversation was good. I, I hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you for being on the show. Um, and if you're listening and you're in the Indianapolis area or driving distance, uh, this episode is sponsored by our upcoming 200-hour yoga teacher training. It's a holistic teacher training um, with myself and Angelique at Embark. It starts March 2019. And um, early bird pricing and everything is on the website. That link is in the show notes. So at EmbarkYoga.com forward slash 200 YTT, you can find out more information. But we're all about therapeutics, alignment, props, really making yoga accessible for everybody and not just saying that but actually making it happen yeah. because of our backgrounds and our philosophies so check that out if you're interested and uh, join us every week um on listen online go to itunes or their apple podcast google play and subscribe to the podcast and if you really are enjoying this podcast please write a review and rate us so that um, we can get your feedback and maybe we'll share that on the show. And uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Wild blessings. <laughs>